Hey, this is the 80 Slasher Librarian, just letting you guys know if you enjoy the content here on the channel and want to support the channel, click on the Patreon link in the description below. As I'm not allowed to monetize the channel here on YouTube, I depend on you guys to keep this channel going and growing by becoming patrons of the channel and sponsoring at the Patreon page. There's great rewards for doing so in tiers as low as 2 to $5 per month. Hey everybody, it's CJ Graham, Jason, Friday the 13th Part 6. Hell Cop and Highway to Hell. Hey, I just want to make sure you guys know you're listening to the 80s slasher librarian. Hi, this is Kane Hodder. Better known as Jason from Friday the 13th, Victor Crowley from Hatchet. I've also played BTK, Ed Gein. Let's just say I've murdered a lot of people. In fact, I've murdered more people on film than any actor in history. So just keep that in mind. You are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. Keep listening, or I'll kill you. Just cause you're playing cool Don't think you got this fool tonight All right Friday the 13th for the final chapter, a fan novelization by Landon Turner. Chapter 3 Country boy, country boy, sitting in the grass, along came a prairie dog and crawled right up his ask me no more questions. The 1973 gold Chevrolet Capri, crammed with six teenagers, flew down the narrow dirt road. Eighteen-year-old Sarah Williams sat quietly in the back seat and watched the trees fly by her window. As she listened to the rest of her friends chant some old folk song that she had never heard before. They had all been singing for the past quarter of a mile, but it didn't bother her much. They all liked to cut up and have a good time, and she was used to it by now. Besides, they had a reason to be singing. The six of them had just graduated from their senior year at Springview High and felt like their young lives were just beginning. They had wanted to go to the beach for their big summer trip before they started college, but none of them had saved up enough money, so they all settled for a few days in the woods instead. After all, it would be much cheaper to rent a cabin in the woods, bring some drugs and booze, spend a few bucks in gas to drive about an hour outside of their town to Crystal Lake, and just relax in the great outdoors. Sarah glanced over at her best friend Samantha, a 17-year-old beautiful and vivacious brunette who was singing along with the two guys sitting up front. Sam's boyfriend, Paul, sat in the driver's seat. His trademark blue baseball cap pulled over his dark hair. Sarah's boyfriend, Doug, sat in the passenger seat. Sarah had been a little hesitant when Doug first asked her if she wanted to come out into the country with him and his friends for a graduation get-together. She'd lived in this area all of her life and had never even been in the woods. She also didn't know some of these people. Paul and Sam had been dating for several months now, but Sarah just wasn't all that close to him. The only time she had ever interacted with Paul while hanging out with Sam was when they wanted to screw around, which was usually whenever they were together. And then there was Ted, one of Paul's friends, who had brought along his friend Jimmy, and she hardly knew them at all. But surely they would all get to know each other a little bit and the tension would ease. Sarah stared out into the thick woods that lined the road. She had heard all sorts of horror stories, especially around this town. Stories of kids going off into the woods around Crystal Lake and never coming back again. She remembered from when she was a kid, and her parents would tell her about a little boy who once drowned there in the lake. It was a tell they would always tell her to try to make sure she didn't swim off where she couldn't reach. It was one of those small town things. There were legends that got passed around and often got passed around so often that they became watered-down versions of what actually happened. But from what she had heard, some stuff did happen at Crystal Lake. Maybe a boy did drown. Maybe some kids did go out in the woods and get involved in a really bad accident but Sarah was sure that most of it was just talk to try to scare you. After all, if all these old people knew how many kids around here used the woods to have sex and smoke grass, she would understand why they would make these things up. 
Sarah knew all too well about how small town people can be. Her parents were a prime example of conservative small town narrow-mindedness. They couldn't stand her being with Doug and couldn't stand Sam. She had had so many long nights with them about it, even right before she decided to go on this trip. You shouldn't be going out in the woods for a weekend with those dope smokers. Sarah, you have a future. She had heard it all before. They were good friends. They just didn't know them like she did. And sure, they liked to party and get high every now and then, but who was she to judge? Who were they to judge? It wasn't a big deal. They had a really good time together. She wasn't that worried about her folks, though. They'd get over it, even though she probably would never hear the end of it. She was more worried about being alone out in a cabin at Crystal Lake, but after all, she was with friends. And Doug told her that they would have some neighbors next door to the cabin they rented, a family with kids. It made her feel a bit safer that they wouldn't all be completely isolated. But she couldn't shake the knot forming in her gut as she stared out at the lonely wilderness on either side of the car. She hadn't seen a house or a store for miles. She wasn't necessarily a city girl by any means, but she wasn't fit for the woods either. Maybe she could smoke some grass to ease her anxiety, but she always tended to pass on it. Sarah didn't really like doing any of that. Even at all the parties that Sam always dragged her along to, Sarah always passed on the weed and the booze. She didn't do that stuff, it just made her so uncomfortable. Sarah hated feeling out of control. It was part of the reason why she also hadn't had sex. That and her parents constantly lecturing her about it. Sarah, you need to save it for marriage. Good girls always save it for marriage. That's what she was really worried about, she thought. Not only her parents, but everyone else, too. Not that it really mattered, but Sam was always talking about her sexual encounters, and Sarah always never had anything to say. She made it so awkward. They would all be sitting around getting high and hooking up while she just sat there with Doug, not knowing how to make a move and being terrified to do anything about it. Sam had always said that it's okay to be a virgin. Save it for when you're ready. But Sarah still felt so self-conscious about it. Maybe it's because she really wanted to do it, but just didn't know how. She couldn't initiate. Well, she thought, maybe this weekend she was finally ready to do it with Doug. After all, they had been dating for three months, and it had gotten hot and heavy at one point. This weekend may finally be the chance to do it. It was now or never, because they were graduating and would likely be going off to different schools. As the thought of sex raced through her mind, she chewed her lip anxiously. Doug had always been understanding about the sex stuff and never pressured her, but she had also never been alone with him in a romantic way except for one other time. And now they definitely had the place and the time to be alone, out in the woods, at night. What would happen if everyone was out screwing and Sarah was left alone with him? What would happen then? Just do it when it feels right, she told herself. If it's not right, then Doug would understand. If she was just going to worry herself to death, if she thought about sex, she decided to shift her mindset to the scenery flying by the car window. Her mind began to drift away from her worries, and she began to hear bits and pieces of Jimmy and Ted's conversation behind her. You broke up with BJ Betty? Ted asked, dumbfounded. Both he and Jimmy were crammed in the open hatchback with the luggage. Jimmy ran his hands anxiously through his sandy, wind-blown hair. So, so to speak, he said, sighing. And would you lighten up on her? She's all right. Ted chuckled, adjusting his sunglasses. I'll say she's all right, he said, grinning. You should have treated her right. That girl wanted to be treated right. I did, I did, I treated her right, Jimmy protested indignantly. That's what's driving me so crazy. Did I, Jimmy thought to himself. Maybe Ted was right. Maybe there was something he had done wrong. Why did he always have to screw it up every time a girl liked him? He'd only been dating this chick for a week and a half, and she totally blew him off. Same with the lass. Jimmy and Ted had been best friends since middle school, and Ted was always the guy that got all the girls. Who could blame the girls? He was one of the coolest guys in school, but more in that bad boy wannabe kind of deal. All the girls loved it. He was all right looking, decent head of hair, nice smile. Jimmy never understood how he did it, but that's how it was. Ted getting the girls, Jimmy's relationships never seeming to work out, and Jimmy crying to Ted for advice. This time, things weren't any different. I mean, first I would call her and she would take my calls, and then she would have something to do, and then she wouldn't even take my calls. Can you figure that? What the fuck happened? 
Jimmy exclaimed, running his hands through his hair again. Ted shook his head. Here, let me put it in the old computer. He rubbed his hands together and Jimmy rolled his eyes. Come on, I'm being serious about this. Hey, the computer don't lie, Ted said. Let's see. Ted held up both his hands, pretending to type on an imaginary keyboard. Jimmy let his head rest on the seat behind him, sighing with exasperation. Ted's computer had been a running joke throughout their friendship, but now Jimmy didn't find it very funny. Many times Jimmy had sat and watched Ted bring up results on the computer, only for them to be one of two things, hurtful insults or a piece of advice that never worked out in the end. Jimmy watched painfully, waiting to hear the results. Ted finished typing and stifled a laugh. He buried his face in his hands. What? Jimmy asked. Ted glanced over at his friend with apologetic eyes shaking his head. It says you're a dead fuck, he said, holding in his laughter. What? Jimmy asked in disbelief. A dead fuck? A lousy lay, Ted explained. You know? Ted held his arms out, his hand dangling suggestively. Oh, don't hold back, Doc. Just give it to me straight, Jimmy exclaimed sarcastically. Hey, I didn't say it. The computer did, Ted said defensively. Yeah, well, there's no computer, Jimmy retorted. Ah, and there's no Betty either, Ted said matter-of-factly. Jimmy sighed defeated. There was no winning with Ted. So I'm a dead fuck, he said miserably. Ted shrugged matter-of-factly. Jimmy flopped back on the headrest and buried his face in his hands. God, I'm horny. The Chevrolet Capri pulled over to the side of the road and came to a stop. Doug fished a map out of his back pocket and started scanning it carefully. Samantha leaned over the seat over Paul's shoulder, her eyes wide with concern. Where are we? We're lost, Paul admitted, forcing a weak smile. Sarah looked out the window and saw that they had come to a stop right beside an old, dilapidated cemetery. A weed-choked iron gate surrounded the perimeter of the cemetery, and all of the tombstones were weathered and faded. She felt a chill run down the length of her spine. She'd always hated cemeteries, ever since she was a kid. Just the fact that she was walking directly over dead bodies gave her goosebumps. She could read the name on one of the newer gravestones. It read, Pamela Voorhees, 1930-1979. Why did that name sound so familiar? The last name, Voorhees. She remembered Doug mentioning something about the name Voorhees when he was asking her to come to Crystal Lake with him. It was probably nothing. Still, she felt the knot forming in her stomach again, and another chill ran up her arm. Stop spooking yourself, Sarah, she told herself. Samantha turned her head and noticed the cemetery. Pretty creepy, Sam said. Yeah, Sarah said, her voice trailing off. Okay, okay, I think we keep going straight for two miles and then hang a right, Doug said, pointing at the map. I hope you're right, Paul said and pulled onto the road. Sarah slowly watched the cemetery disappear from view. She couldn't take her eyes off of that one gravestone. It looked newer than the others. They must have died within the last few years. Voorhees. What was it about that name? Voorhees. Pamela Voorhees. She repeated the name in her mind, trying to remember why that name gave her such an awful feeling. What had Doug said about the name Voorhees? Oh well, she wasn't paying attention when he had said it, and she shouldn't be worried about it now. It was probably just another Crystal Lake legend that their parents had always talked about and always warned them about. It was part of why her folks had been so adamant about them not going up to Crystal Lake. They said something about a campground where bad things happened. But if anything did happen, it was years ago. All of those things were just exaggerations. She was just letting her imagination run wild. Nothing would go wrong if they were all out there together. Sarah was starting to feel like her life was just beginning. She had had her best friend, her boyfriend, and they were going to enjoy a peaceful weekend in the country and nothing, and nobody was going to stop them. There was nothing to be afraid of. <coughs> Patty Cunningham let out an exhausted sigh. If someone had told her before she decided to go on a weekend camping trip for some peace and relaxation, that she would end up broken down on the side of the road and forced to hitchhike in unbearable heat covered in mosquito bites from head to toe, 
she never would have gone in the first place. Go to Crystal Lake, they said. Take some time off, they said. Take a vacation, they said. They had all told her it was just what she needed, and not to blame them. They were right. With her husband running off on her and getting laid off from her job, it had been a stressful two months, and finally, when she had almost reached her breaking point, her best friend Linda grabbed her by the shoulders and told her to take a vacation. But she had no idea that her car would stall. Of course, she wanted to blame Linda, but it wasn't her fault. Nobody could have predicted that she would have had to hitchhike all the way to Crystal Lake while carrying her suitcase and knapsack in 98 degree weather. And the worst part of it was she hadn't seen a single car since she started walking. No one lived out here. Ever since she left the town of Crystal Lake, she hadn't seen a single sign of civilization. It was hopeless. She would be forced to walk the next 10 miles to the spot by Crystal Lake that she had mapped out back home. She looked both ways down the desolate road. There was no sign of life anywhere. I'm fucked, she thought miserably. She saw an old tree stump not too far from the side of the road, and she tossed her stuff down and sat. It could be worse, Patty thought to herself. She could have gotten into a wreck and be injured. She definitely didn't need to be hitchhiking down the road in the heat with a broken leg. It'll be all right. Someone has got to come by eventually, she thought. She was fortunate that she found some old Save the Trees picket signs in her trunk from her tree hugger days in college. They were bright and colorful and were sure to attract a passing motorist. She had all her things. There was food and a sleeping bag in her suitcase. She could even camp out under the stars if it came to it. Maybe this wouldn't be such a ruined vacation after all. Just then, her thought was confirmed when she saw the front end of a 1973 Chevy Capri coming toward her down the country road. She grabbed her brightest sign and sprang to her feet, holding up the sign and waving her arms frantically. It was her big chance. Patty's shoulders slumped as she watched the Chevy fly right by, and she let her arms fall to her side, defeated. You have got to be shitting me, Patty thought to herself. The one car that passes by is full of a bunch of damn kids, a bunch of spoiled teens. She had seen the smirk on the face of the dark-haired boy wearing sunglasses in the back. Damn kids, she thought sourly. Just as the car began to disappear around the corner, the dark-haired kid in the sunglasses leaned out of the open hatchback. Hey, honey, you got a sister? He yelled out to her. He let out a guffaw of laughter. She heard the rest of the teens cackle with laughter as well. Patty couldn't believe it. She was speechless. But then she remembered that during her protesting days in college, there were more than a few people that didn't take too kindly to them parading around with their rainbow-colored signs. So her group had painted Fuck You on the back of the signs in black spray paint. She knew it would come in handy. She flipped around the sign and gave him the middle finger for good measure. But he didn't see it. The car was far down the country road. What was this world coming to? A world where people just pay no attention to someone who needs help. A world where, where people drive right by a woman on the side of the road just wanting a ride. Of course, she had heard all the horror stories about murderous hitchhikers, so she kind of didn't blame them. But still, there was no need to say things like that. What kind of parents would raise a child like that? That little prick needed to have the shit beaten out of him. That's what was wrong with this generation. Nobody hit their kids anymore. They were raising goddamn nightmares. She knew she was overweight, and she knew she wasn't all that attractive, but these disrespectful bastards just didn't know when to keep their mouths shut. Was she like that when she was younger? Surely not. Was she an awful immature person who would have done something like that? No, no, it was different in her day. They would learn. It would come back to bite them in the ass. Maybe a few days from now, or maybe a few years. Patty threw her hands in the air and plopped back down on the tree stump, realizing that she hadn't eaten since she left home. Her stomach was grumbling loudly. She reached down into the side pocket of her suitcase and pulled out a ripe banana, and peeled it, biting into the soft fruit. She was too busy munching loudly on her banana to hear the footsteps behind her, slow and steady at first then growing quicker and agitated. Then, she heard the leaves crunching behind her, light footfalls. Someone was behind her. But Patty didn't have time to see who it was. A hand grabbed her by the hair in a fierce talon-like grip, and another hand shoved a hunting knife into the back of her neck. She vomited up a hideous mixture of blood and banana, horrified at the sight of the bloody tip of the knife protruding from the front of her throat. In the throes of death, Patty's right hand clenched, squeezing the banana into mush, and she felt life ebb quickly. 
Jason Voorhees stood over her lifeless corpse, once again feeling the boiling rage inside of him subside. He stared down the road at the Chevrolet Capri becoming tiny in the distance, and he clenched his fist. He had watched them drive by and heard their laughter, young teenage laughter. None of them deserved that happiness. They all deserved nothing short of unadulterated annihilation and pure loathing. This Friday the 13th weekend, they would all pay. For so long, he waited, waited for them to return so he could kill once again. And now it would all be worth it. He would be doing just what his mother had wanted, to end the lives of the counselors and any other abhorrent teenagers who decided to come to his home, his hunting grounds. He hid out in that shack in the woods undetected by law enforcement, and anyone who did find his shack was easily dispatched. Then he saw them, walking through the woods in scantily clad clothing, laughing, fondling, and groping each other. Counselors, the ones his mother had tried to kill. Back on his land, at his camp in his woods. He couldn't let them get away with it. He couldn't let them get away with engaging in those filthy acts at his lake. They would all see why nobody returns to Crystal Lake to do disgusting and sick things to each other on his property, Jason's campgrounds. And he felt the rage return, and it burned even more intensely than the last time, threatening to consume him. Jason was back. The nightmare at Crystal Lake was far from over. The birds and the bees. Night had fallen, and the lights in the Jarvis house glowed brightly. The moon shimmered on the surface of the lake, and the waves softly crashed against the sandy shore, pushed by the cool night breeze. The symphony of all the nocturnal animals coming out to make their calls was in full swing. Mrs. Jarvis stared nervously out the kitchen window above the sink, looking out into the pitch-black darkness. She couldn't stop thinking of the news report. She couldn't stop thinking about the murders. Ten bodies, they had said on the news, and there were even more bodies that had been found across the lake. Of course, the lake was big and stretched across many miles, and although it was on the same lake, it was probably pretty far away. But not far enough, she thought, not far enough to put her mind at ease. She was nearly missing the tomato she was trying to slice, and had almost nicked herself with the large butcher knife. Her knuckles were curled tightly around the handle. She kept getting distracted from looking down at the cutting board and glancing at the doors and the windows. She had been paranoid all night. The last three times she had peeked out the kitchen window, she could have sworn she saw something move. Was it just the way the tree branches were casting shadows, or just her imagination? Tommy and Trish had no idea that the last two days there had been a maniac running amok across Crystal Lake, but she just couldn't bring herself to tell them. Even though Tommy loved making those terrifying masks and played all those violent games, he could still get scared. She faintly remembered their apartment in the city getting robbed, and Tommy couldn't sleep for weeks afterwards. She had come home to the door jimmied open in a ransacked office and kitchen, and Tommy standing there frozen with terror, his eyes glassed over, almost in a trance. For the next two or three months, he would cry out in the middle of the night, prompting her to have to run in and rock him back to sleep. She couldn't imagine how he would react if she told him there had been a killer on the loose. After all, the killer was dead, wasn't he? The guy was dead. But somehow, her mind wouldn't let her believe it. She hadn't turned on the television all morning. She didn't want them to see anything about it, and it wouldn't do her any good to watch it either. She looked over at Tommy, who was setting the table for dinner. Should she tell him about it, she thought, just so he would be careful? She was about to open her mouth when Trish walked into the kitchen eyeing the casserole dish of tuna salad on the stove that Mrs. Jarvis was preparing. Ah, oh, Mom, I thought we were having pizza for dinner, Trish said. I thought so, too, but the refrigerator is full of leftovers, Mrs. Jarvis said, cleaning her hands with the dish rack. Trish frowned. You're not smiling. You aren't in the mood for tuna salad? 
Mrs. Jarvis asked. Well, Trish sighed, disappointed. She glanced over at Tommy, who walked over towards the counter to grab another plate. Mrs. Jarvis and her daughter gave each other a knowing look. They both began to sneak towards Tommy, who looked on with displeasure, shaking his head and backing away. Trish came up from behind him, and they sandwiched him in. I know what I'm in the mood for, Mrs. Jarvis said, grinning deviously. No, no, Tommy protested, but it was too late. They both wrapped their arms around him and pinned him in between the both of them. A Jarvis, Jarvis sandwich! Trish and her mother cried, mock laughing maniacally and squeezing the struggling Tommy as tight as they could. Wait, wait, I, I, I heard something at the door, Tommy exclaimed. Uh, oh no, I'm not falling for that, Mrs. Jarvis said, hugging him tighter as he wriggled free from her grasp. Tommy broke free and moved towards the door. No, I heard that too, Trish said. He was right. Something was scratching wildly on the door. Tommy swung open the door and was greeted by a large, shaggy golden retriever leaping up on him and licking the side of his face. Hey, boy! Hey, Gordon! Tommy greeted the excited family dog, tousling his silky fur. Where you been, Gordon? You been sneaking around? You got a girlfriend or something? Tommy cooed playfully as Gordon unfurled his tongue and pawed at him in response. Gordon hopped down and trotted happily into the kitchen, where Mrs. Jarvis and Trish both petted him affectionately. Gordon was a stray they had found a few months after moving to Crystal Lake. He was wandering around their property for about a week, and he eventually became the family pet. Mrs. Jarvis had gone and put up flyers around town, but nobody claimed him, so they gave him a name, and he had been with them ever since. Tommy began to close the front door when he got a glimpse of two headlights coming down the country road, cutting through the inky black darkness. A 1973 Chevrolet came to a stop in front of the rental house next door, and there was a loud clamor as the six teenagers piled out of the car. Hey, I think those kids that rented the house next door are here, Tommy said, stepping out onto the front porch and eyeing the two slender, dark-haired girls that climbed out of the back. His eyes grew wide. He had been homeschooled for as long as he could remember, and he had never seen a girl so pretty. They were both gorgeous, especially the girl with the darkest hair. He felt a tingling sensation in his stomach. What was happening, he thought to himself. It was just a girl. Why did he feel so weird? She wasn't that attractive. Oh, who was he kidding? She was the most beautiful girl he had ever laid his eyes on. And she was going to be living next door to him for the next few days, maybe even for an entire week. Trish stepped out beside him, calling back inside to her mother. We're going to go say hi, Trish said and closed the door. Trish and Tommy climbed down the rickety porch steps and walked down the path towards the rental house. The rental house was a Victorian-style clappered two-story bungalow with a balcony and a sprawling porch. A big, octagonal picture window overlooked the front yard. The two slender, dark-haired girls getting out of the back seat of the car noticed them and waved. Gordon came bounding up behind Trish and Tommy and leapt up on the prettier of the two girls, licking her enthusiastically. Oh, Samantha cried, giggling. Hey, boy. Gordon, bad dog, Trish exclaimed and swatted him away. Oh, he's all right, Sam said. I'm Samantha. Sam shook Trish's hand. Hi, I'm Trish and this is Tommy. We're the Jarvises. We live next door. Trish introduced herself amicably. The girl with the lighter hair extended her hand. I'm Sarah, she said, shaking Trish's hand. Nice to meet you both. Tommy stood frozen with fascination. The prettier of the two girls, Samantha, was wearing a low-cut top and her cleavage was almost too much to handle. He had never seen a pair of breasts before. He knew girls had them, but he had never actually seen this much of them before. His hands were beginning to sweat, and his heart was racing. Sam bent down to pet Gordon, and his eyes fell right down her blouse. What a handsome mutt you are, Samantha said, laughing, her breast practically falling out of her top. His name is Gordon, Trish said, noticing Tommy's blank expression. She followed his gaze to Samantha's well-endowed assets. Trish gave him a dirty look and swatted him, but honestly, she was checking out a few of the guys herself. Two of them were standing at the trunk heaving suitcases out of the back and pulling them into a pile. One was really good-looking, and the other was decent, she decided. The good-looking one was tall and lanky with a head of thick black hair that reminded her of Elvis, 
wearing a pair of sunglasses. They both wore straight leg jeans that made the muscles in their legs show and wore stylish dress shirts and slick black hair. She saw some of them were carrying graduation caps and surmised they had all dressed up for the ceremony. Another suave-looking guy in a blue baseball cap called out to an attractive dark-haired guy to throw him a beer. The dark-haired guy tossed him a can of beer and carried the rest of the case into the house. The guy in the baseball cap popped the lid, took a swig, and cheered. Samantha giggled and rolled her eyes. That's Paul acting like an idiot, she said, and that's Jimmy and Ted. She pointed to the two guys standing at the trunk, unloading the luggage. Hey, Doug, come meet our neighbors. Sarah called to the dark-haired guy coming out of the house. It wasn't the guy with the baseball cap or the guy who looked like Elvis, but he was attractive too. He almost bore resemblance to a young Sean Cassidy. Trisha's hands were beginning to sweat as well. She wasn't keeping up with their names. She just smiled lightly and tried not to stare. She wanted to say something, anything. Nothing came out, but just more standing and smiling. Doug, as Sarah had called him, came running over to meet them, shaking Trisha's hand with a firm grasp. His wavy dark hair fell over his sparkling green eyes. This is my boyfriend, Doug, Sarah said, smiling. Trish felt a slight disappointment that he and Sarah were together, but she smiled anyway. I'm Trish, and this is my brother Tommy. You guys live around here? asked Sam. Yeah, right there, Trish said, pointing back towards the house. Cool. Looks like we're going to be neighbors for the next three days anyway, Doug said, smiling. He was gorgeous, Trish thought. He was tanned and muscular, and his teeth were perfectly straight. But who was she kidding? She certainly didn't have the body of Samantha or Sarah. Well, if you guys need anything, we're right next door, Trish said, figuring they would take the hint and offer an invitation. Sure thing, Samantha said with a cheerful grin, tossing her jet black hair behind her shoulders. She was drop-dead beautiful, thought Trish. There was no way she wasn't hooked up with one of these guys, if not two or three of them. Her perfect olive complexion and hourglass figure were to die for. Well, see you around. Trish said. Let's go back to the house, Tommy. She tugged him gently on the arm, but he was still mesmerized by Samantha. Trish yanked on his sleeve more firmly, and he finally succumbed, following her back to the house. As they climbed the porch steps to their house, Trish took one last glance back at the rental home. The guy that looked like Elvis was leaning against the porch railing, sipping a can of beer and talking to Paul. Samantha ran up beside Paul and pressed her body against his and Paul lifted her up into her arms and spun her around. Samantha guffawed with laughter, swatting at him. Put me down, she cried playfully. Trish sighed, watching as the handsome guy in the cap set Samantha on the ground and kissed her passionately, his hand groping her buttocks. Trish smiled weakly and shook her head wistfully. For the longest time, she had been so lonely. Living out in the middle of the woods never brought her any friends, much less a boyfriend. The last boyfriend she had was in the sixth grade that she was forced to part with when her mother pulled them out of the city and dragged them out to the middle of nowhere in a hick town called Crystal Lake, away from civilization. She tried going to the local high school, but it had been a disaster. The whole school treated her like an outcast because she was from the city. They called her names, and she sat by herself at lunch. Much to her chagrin, Mrs. Jarvis pulled Trish out of that terrible influence and settled in at home where she had been homeschooled up until now. Now she almost wished she had just begged her mom to let her stay, that she could handle being bullied, but she had just gone along with it. She didn't like not having many friends. All she had were the ones that she kept in touch with back in the city, and her mother was in no way interested in moving back to the bustle of the city. She was dying to meet someone. She hoped that she could wait until she moved off to college to some prestigious university in a big city, but she didn't know if she could handle the cabin fever much longer. How much longer did she have before she would totally lose it? She was probably just being dramatic. After all, what was so wrong with going over and asking if they wanted to hang out? Why didn't anybody do that anymore? Why couldn't anyone just be honest and forthright with each other and explain your intentions clearly? Maybe she should just go over there and tell them all her family was driving her crazy and just come out right with it. But then, would they take her seriously or just rebuff her like the kids at school did? Well, there was only one way to find out. Just be nice, she thought, and be cool. Just go over and talk to them and let them get to know you. Maybe she could go over and visit them before they left, 
but she wasn't sure if her mother would be all too pleased at Trish going over to party with a bunch of teenagers she had never met before tonight. They were drinking and looked way too rowdy for Tracy Jarvis's standards. No, she would have to sneak over there when her mom went out jogging later or when she went to bed before the weekend was over. What would be the harm in that? It would be good to socialize. She may even meet a foxy guy and start something or just have a few drinks and maybe smoke a joint or two. My God, Trish thought. She imagined the look on her mother's face if she had ever said the word marijuana around her. She could hear her disapproving tone in her head. She hadn't tried grass before, but lots of her friends back home did it, and she didn't see the big deal. After all, she knew all about how marijuana was stigmatized in this country from reading books at the local library in town. She had read about how lots of anti-pot propaganda gave it a bad rep and how a campaign mostly steered by Ronald Reagan started the war on drugs, and now weed was becoming one of the most frequently used illicit substances, when in reality, it was a lot more comparable to alcohol than, say, heroin. It was one of the safest drugs, and she had always been eager to try it, but she worried about her mother smelling it on her if she were to come home in the middle of the night. She would have to sneak out, she thought, and take a quick shower or something. She wondered how long they were going to stay. Don't get your hopes up, she told herself. They could be gone tomorrow. It was just a rental house. She may as well just forget it. Had even happened, but she still felt a tinge of excitement as she stepped through the side door of the house, just feet away from the huge figure bathed in black standing behind the tree. Jason tightened his grip on the brown leather handle of the hunting knife, the blade still coated with the blood from the fat hitchhiker. Jason hadn't intended on killing her, but still he felt no regret. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Jason walked around the side of the Jarvis house, seeing Mrs. Jarvis staring wearily out the kitchen window at the rental house. Jason followed her gaze to the group of teenagers, carrying luggage through the front door of the house, laughing and chatting, sounding so young and careless and joyous, it sickened him. Jason felt the rage swell, and he took a heavy breath, struggling to contain the white streaks of fury and rage that flashed before his eyes. Desperate to quell the burning lust that was a powder keg within it, ready to ignite. They were all the same. Just look at them, touching each other intimately and enjoying themselves while doing it. They were touching each other the same way that those two counselors who should have been watching him were touching each other. Those two mindless teenagers who cared nothing about satisfying their selfish needs, heedless of the life that had been entrusted to them. They were all the same. Now he knew they had to die. They all had to die. Eventually, they all proved they were just as repugnant as the rest of them. He pictured his knife piercing the girl with the dark hair's soft flesh, the blade penetrating the flesh between her two ample breasts, penetrating her heart. He pictured the blade slicing through the boy's toned body, ripping through tendons and ligaments until he stopped screaming, hacking away at his remains until there was nothing left. The visions he would have were so vivid and salient that they made his mouth water and his heart race. Visions of blood, of screaming and entrails pouring out of wounds and of eviscerated corpses. Every time he killed and saw the glaring red of the blood spilling out of their worthless bodies, it soothed the tightness in his chest and the pounding in his head. Everything felt right again. But then, when he saw them touching each other and enjoying themselves, everything got loud again, and he had to kill. There was no other way. He had no other options. The voice of his mother guided him, the real-life manifestation of the deep pain that he felt ever since he watched his mother die as she fought for her life was more than enough to satisfy him, but only for a short time. They all deserved punishment. His mother had been right. He had to finish what she had started 26 years ago. This Friday the 13th, they would all pay.
Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 3 of Friday the 13th, Part 4, the fan novelization by Landon Turner. I want to say thank you to my wife, Beth, for voicing Mrs. Jarvis and Sarah. I hope you all are enjoying this book so far. I'm going to try to have chapters out a little quicker uh, going forward. Just uh, had a lot of stuff going on this month. It's been kind of hectic. Uh, but I'm really enjoying this fan novelization. It's uh, been a lot of fun. It's going to be interesting voicing Jimmy. Uh, I can't exactly do a Crispin Glover impersonation, but I can try to make him as awkward as possible. Uh, I like how we're getting kind of a deep dive into some of these characters' heads. And, of course, I always enjoy uh, when an author takes us into the mind of Jason and what makes him tick. So, going forward, I'm curious to see if Landon touches on uh, some things that weren't answered in the movie, like what happened uh, to Mrs. Jarvis, you know? Uh, are we going to get to see her actually... Uh, are we going to get to read slash hear about how she actually died. Uh, curious. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun with this. I hope you are too. Uh, so yeah, thank. be sure to thank Landon for writing this, because without this, there wouldn't be a novelization for, for uh, what I think is one of the best movies in the series. Uh, let me know what you guys think of the book so far, what you thought of tonight's chapter, and I'll be back very soon with more of Friday the 13th for the final chapter by Landon Turner. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood slasher librarian saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. And uh, be sure to click the thumbs up button because I heard uh, something about the thumbs down that... Uh, it's got a death curse!